from HanselMinutes.com. It's Hansel Minutes, a weekly discussion with web developer and technologist Scott Hanselman. This is Lawrence Ryan announcing show number 414, recorded live Thursday, March 6th, 2014. This episode of Hansel Minutes is brought to you by Telerik, offering the best in developer tools and support online at T-E-L-E-R-I-K.com. And by Franklin's.net, makers of Gesture Pack, a powerful gesture recording and recognition system for Microsoft Connect for Windows developers. Details at GesturePAK.com. In this episode, Scott talks with Elon Feingold about the Plex software ecosystem. Hi, this is Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes, and I'm on the phone with Elon Feingold from Hawaii. That's awesome. Thanks. Great to be here. Thanks for having me on. So you're the lead developer on the Plex project, on the Plex. Uh, which parts of Plex do you are you the lead on? Um, well, that's a good question. I, I've worked on a lot of things over the years. Um, pretty much a lot of the clients, the server software, the cloud software, pretty much anywhere I've needed. So I, I'm kind of all over the place depending on <laughs> where I'm needed. So I got introduced to Plex a couple of years ago when I was trying to find the, the you know the 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 great media center. Like this has been the the quest of my life to find a media. I did Windows Media Center and I've tried XMBC and I've tried RASBMC and all these. Just all I want to do is watch my movies wherever and whenever on everything. And I'm like, is that so hard? Uh, <laughs> but it has always been a challenge. Uh, what does Plex do that's different? It, it turns out to be hard. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and, and it was actually scratching that media itch that, that kind of brought me to the project in the first place. Mm-hmm. But, um, but you've, you've essentially stated your, your desire is essentially exactly what we set out to provide, which is your media anywhere you are and at any time. So we sort of try to, um, you know, there's, there's obviously a few different ways to consume media. If you're inside your house, you're on a local network, you generally have some sort of thing hooked up to a big screen TV. So that's kind of like one, one way to consume media. Um, then people have mobile devices. So they might be walking around the house with an iPhone or an iPad. And then, um, they also might be outside of the house, you know, in a car during a commute and, even further and more difficult is like on a submarine with no internet access. So <laughs> what we strive to do is give you access to all of your media in all of those different situations mm-hmm. and keep it um, not only that, because that, you know, might not be that hard, just, just that part, but we also strive to give you sort of a centralized um, view and history into all of your media. So whether you're watching on the submarine and coming back later or on an airplane or, streaming live, everything's kind of cohesive and coherent and, and, and every, your view history and stuff like that is kept in one centralized area. Yeah. When I started with my quest to watch anything whenever I wanted to, I basically just, I threw it up on a share on my, my NAS, on my network attached storage. I happen to have a Synology. And then I tried to use different clients to pull from that share. And I kind of figured, well, there's the Windows sharing protocol, the you know, SMB, standard, you know, simple message block. And it's on whack, whack, server, whack, movies. And I would use my PlayStation over here in this room. I'd use my Windows machine in this room. I'd use some weird app that I found on the iPad. And I was attempting to pull these things to the devices I wanted to watch them on and then trust that each of these very diverse devices and very diverse pieces of software would know how to read the MP4 container that I was with. And I would inevitably find myself where some things played some places and they were very unreliable. It was very frustrating. Why is this such a problem with MP4? I thought that this was a solved problem. Well, going with MP4 is actually definitely, if you're looking for universal compatibility, is definitely one of the best container formats to to go with. It's probably the best. Um, there are some nuances to MP4. Like, for example, um, depend the the metadata for the file, the, the move atom, so to speak, mm-hmm. can be at the beginning of the file, the end of the file. Some players only play if it's at the beginning of the file. Um, but not all software generates it at the beginning of the file. So that's a difficulty. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also codecs involved. Generally, um, MP4s have H.264, which works fine for video, but for the audio, you could have um, AAC, you could have AC3. Some people even crazily mux DTS into their MP4 files. So there's just a lot of different, you know. And then don't get me started with subtitles. Well, that was um, my next problem. I went and I got a. Uh, I was looking at Captain Phillips, 
and I was trying to watch Captain Phillips, and I'm watching this thing, and I'm on Plex, and I'm on the plane, and it gets to the part where the Somali pirates start talking, and I have no idea what these guys are talking about. So apparently the subtitles didn't make it over. Yeah, and that that's actually what you're saying right there is a fascinating case, because in that case, um, so we try to do a bunch of clever things to determine whether or not the subtitle should show up. Um, cause first of all, we, you know, we know in your preferences what language you prefer to see subtitles in. We, in theory, know the language of the audio stream and we, in theory, know the language of the subtitle stream. So by default, why would we put English subtitles on an English movie? But just recently we added support for forced subtitle detection and forced subtitles basically say, you know, like an alien speaking in district nine or your Somali pirates in captain Phillips. Uh, they say, you know, okay, it is English, but force this to be on. Cause you're going to want to see these subs. Um, and we do some of the detection of that. Now I'm not completely sure if the forced subtitle, uh, bit is allowable in the MP4 container. I'm not entirely right. sure. And, well, on I don't that. even know if I made the MP4 correctly in that case, you know? Exactly. It's, it's crazy. The, the, I mean, if the, if you take codecs and formats and containers and all that kind of stuff, it's crazy the kind of stuff that we see in the wild. I mean, you are amazing because you've gotten all your stuff in MP4. So we love you because you make, you make our lives a lot easier <laughs> to get all your media everywhere. But I mean, people come with, um, AVIs generated from like broken cameras from well, 10 years yeah, ago. Yeah. So there's like, that. I do have home movies from like flip cams. Uh, right. Exactly. You know, what are you going to do? But you know, I said I have everything in MP4s, but I'm looking at my folders here and some of them are M4V and I don't know what the difference is and why M4Vs look smaller sometimes, but they, I don't even know why, be, how they got that way. Yeah, as far as I know, it's been a question we've, we've asked ourselves over the years. As far as I know, they're almost entirely identical except for one or two atoms of metadata. Mm-hmm. But otherwise, they're, you know, same file structure and, and generally same codecs inside. Okay. So let's, let's back up a step because we've been geeking out for a few minutes here, but we haven't actually explained to people who aren't familiar with Plex how it works and why it's different. So in that first scenario I described, I was counting on smart clients to pull from a dumb file share. Right. But I have this NAS, I have this machine that is the, you know, smart. It's more than just a dumb system because it's got an Intel processor. It's a Synology 1511. Uh, so it's got some good memory and it's got some good processors. And I install Plex on the NAS itself, on the either the Windows machine or the Mac, or in this case on the Synology Linux box. What is Plex doing there and why is it, why is a client server solution needed? Yeah, and you, you hit upon the key thing there with with the dumb clients uh, or the dumb server and the smart clients or vice versa. Uh, we we want your media to be everywhere, and that can be um, you know from a range of on a Mac Mini connected to your TV, which is obviously very smart and very powerful, to you know an HTML5 app, which is obviously very dumb, and if it's running on a lightweight system, not very powerful. So in order to do that, we put the smarts um, on the server, and the server basically has a super uh, smart. T- uh, transcoder that can on the fly convert media from one format to another. Um, and then there's all this sort of talking that goes on where the client says to the server, I want this, I can handle that. And the server does all the conversion on the fly. Mm-hmm. So that's, that's kind of the key, uh, point of our client server architecture is to centralize the smarts about the, and do all the conversions on the fly, um, on the server side. Yeah. That right there is so well said because that changed everything for me. It went from a mess of files in a folder to an attractive catalog of information with, with screen caps and metadata and album art and director's information and all this stuff that just wasn't well organized before. And the idea that I could be watching it on my laptop, pause it, go into the workout room, and then pick it up where I left off on the tablet, all because the server knows more than the client does, right? Exactly. And, and you've hit upon the other key point of, of the centralized solution, which is the metadata. You know, we, we have a really smart conversion engine on the fly. So you can actually play your videos back anywhere you are, mm-hmm. but we also have super rich metadata. So we basically build this great big database of all of your, of all your, you know, movies and music and photos. Um, and so you can do a lot of browsing based on genres or directors or actors or, um, stuff like that. And like you said, we can also keep centralized state so that you can do that kind of uh, view progress and resuming. Mm-hmm. Um, and we also have rich multi-user functionality. If you have a Plex Pass, which means you can have, you know, multiple people in your house and outside of your house, all with their own view into the server. So mm-hmm. they all have their all their own view of the on deck, you know, what TV shows they're watching and stuff like that. So it's super powerful. Yeah, we should circle back and talk about the Plex Pass in a little bit. But the 
the, the server is running on my NAS, and then I can load up my iPad or my Windows Surface, and I can see what I've been watching. I usually sort sort by recently added, although you can sort it and filter it you know, in any way that you want. Um, one of the things that I noticed, though, is that when I'm at a hotel, if I stream from home, because I punched a hole in the firewall, and I set it all up the way Plex said to set it up, um, it's smart about the speed. Um, I mean, on crappy hotel Wi-Fi or on LTE, you're actually squishing because you know I'm on a, on a phone. You know I'm far away from home. Yeah, there's a, there are some quality settings you can make to tweak it. But by default, when you're accessing over, let's say, a mobile connection or remote connection, we default to doing it. Um, lower quality streams, basically lower bandwidth streams to mm-hmm. take account for that. Um, and you can, you know, if you're on a train or something with LTE or whatever, you can bump that quality down even further, depending on what's needed. Um, in the future, we'll do that a lot more intelligently and kind of on the fly. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there, there's a giant volume knob on the quality that you can set depending on, you know, where you are. So at home, you can get a full HD file. And if you're on a train with pretty crappy 3G service, you can still watch your video. It just won't look as pretty. Mm-hmm. And are you, you know, transcoding those and putting them in temp files? Or is this entirely in memory on the fly? Are, are processors fast enough to do that now? So what we do, um, the transcoder is actually super smart. It, it, the, the format that we convert to is generally uh, called HTTP live streaming, HLS, which is something that Apple kind of invented and now pretty much everyone supports. Mm-hmm. Um, we do support a few other, uh, formats too, like Silverlight smooth streaming for the device, older Microsoft devices and stuff like that. But in general, it's, it's HTTP live streaming. It's a segmented format. So the transcoder will write the segments to disk. Um, and the server will, you know, serve them out as needed. We don't keep it in memory just because that, that would, you know, might grow and we kind of want to leave a, a bigger buffer. But the transcoder is smart enough to know, um, how far ahead it is. So depending on, you know, what you're playing and stuff like that, it'll transcode, let's say 30 seconds ahead and throw those segments onto the disk and then throttle out idle. So it, it's actually really cool. Like that doesn't sound like a serious thing to be doing, but with that, with that change where the transcoder is pretty much idle on demand, you can get, you know, like 10 to 15 streams off of a single server without that much power. We've had people that have like gotten streams going on all their device, you know, iOS devices, laptops, and just loaded up the entire house streaming at once. And it was totally fine. Yeah. I, I, I have heard discussion though, that some of the lower power systems, like an Atom processor can't pull this off, but any decent Intel NAS can do this without a problem. Yeah, and the key to that, and we actually we're actually on the Drobo 5N, which is an ARM. It's like a quad core ARM processor. Mm-hmm. And the, the key really on those lower powered systems is, if at all possible, Remux don't transcode, because um, Remuxing is essentially just re repackaging your MP4 and your example over to HLS segments. So we're not actually generating or we're not actually decoding or encoding H.264. We're just repackaging it, and that's incredibly fast. Even an ad, even a an ARM processor can do that. I see. So if I'm watching, if I've got it in an MP4 already and I want to watch it on an iPad, you might have to do minimal work if I'm inside my house to get that across the wire. Exactly. Minimal work and absolutely no no loss of quality. Generally, if anything, we have to transcode the audio. If you say, if you have like AC3 inside there, the iPad doesn't do that. So we'll convert the audio over to AAC. And mm-hmm. that's, you know, obviously um, orders of magnitude cheaper than than doing H.264 conversion. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the features that's like the killer feature on the iPad, although I have both a Surface and an iPad, is the ability to uh, sync it down um, locally. And I was actually talking to a buddy of mine uh, uh, who works who we, uh, works for Pixar, who is really frustrated that he's got a bunch of you know valid and legal MP4s that he 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 paid for and he should be able to watch. And he has no good way to get them onto his iPad. He's like, I can't really mount it as a disc. I can't FTP they, they it They make in. it super hard. Yeah. yeah. And when I put it in iTunes, iTunes says, eh, no, I don't really like that one. And there's no explanation for why. And, then, and not to pick on iTunes, although iTunes is a big target. It's just a steaming pile of crap. Um, and when you drop a file in that it doesn't like, it's just like, nah. Uh, but with Plex, you're doing the transcoding all at once on the server and saying, I'm going to get this all ready for you, package it to you, and bring it over, and it's going to be stored, if I understand correctly, in the Plex application container. It's it's personal storage. Correct. Correct. Yeah, we, we, I mean, we, we already have all the smarts for the live conversion. So we basically just use those same smarts to convert over to, uh, to an MP4 file in this case, but one that's, 
you know, in theory, compatible with just about any of your your client devices. So it'll do any transcoding that needs to be done. Um, and then you'll end up with an MP4 file that's then synced over to the device for playback yeah. on the go. It has been the easiest way for me to get a file. Like I, I have a couple movies I want to watch in the plane. I go boom, boom, boom. I let it sync. It takes a couple hours if the file hasn't already been squished and I'm on my way. And I honestly haven't plugged my iPad into iTunes in a year since I got Plex. That's cool. Yeah, it's nice to be able to do it without plugging it into being able to do it over Wi-Fi and stuff like that. Yeah, nice. Wi-Fi sync on the iPad seemed like a great idea, but it never works, consist- works consistently. It never works for me either. It can't find iTunes or iTunes, iTunes can't find the device. I don't understand it. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. seem like rocket science. Um, now, I've tried to use uh, this DNL, DLNA. Can you explain what DLNA is and why that is important? Yeah, that's that's a great question. I always get those confused. DLNA, DNLA. It's like the worst acronym on the planet and try to explain that to your parents. Like, no, dad, you, you should be using DLNA. What? Well, yeah. Um, and there's, is there, is there, there's a DLNA. That's this whole, so, LANA. There's no way to say it. Digital Living Room Network Alliance. Right. It's the only acronym with the word living room in it, I guess, but <laughs> uh, it's meant to make your, 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 your smart set top box be able to pull content from a reliable server. I guess we used to call these UPnP servers. Yeah, DLNA is an extension of UPnP. I mean, essentially DLNA is it's a client server solution, so that's great. You know, you have a DLNA server and DLNA clients. And in theory, um you know, there's hundreds of millions of DLNA clients. Pretty much any TV you have is DLNA compatible. Receivers will be DLNA compatible. Um and Plex is actually a DLNA server. You probably already knew that, but that's the reason why you can play with Plex, let's say on an Xbox 360 where we don't have an app, but you can play via DLNA. But the, so the promise of DLNA was huge, right? I mean, same kind of thing, client server media, get your media streamed anywhere. But the problem with DLNA is it's a massively complex protocol and everyone implements it differently. And there's no real standardized file formats. So, for example, one TV might play MKVs, another might only play MP4s. Um, so it's it's a really mucky protocol. It's not rich in terms of metadata, so you don't get um, all the you know. It's just basic hier- hierarchical browsing with no real semantic um, value to it. Uh, and in general, the the implementations on the client are buggy and complicated and work in very different ways. Yeah, I've had pretty spotty. Um I've had it's had it's been a spotty experience with DL, DLNA. I I like the way that uh, good DLNA servers, Plex being one of them, make a f- um, a fake folder hierarchy. So right, you've right. got like recently added or by year or by genre, which isn't a real folder, but it looks like a folder. It's like a view on the data. Exactly. But I'm finding that I have both an Xbox 360 and I have a, uh, a PlayStation. PlayStation seems to more reliably be able to play video than the uh than, than the 360 even though i think you're do you detect which one is going to talk to you yeah, and try to do the right thing yeah we, we absolutely we have a dlna profiles, so we we can detect who's coming in and what they want like for example a ps3 tends to be slightly better because it can actually understand uh h264 so a lot of times we can just remux it over so it's fast and the quality is super great uh for the xbox 360 i believe we transcode over to wmv which is uh just not something that uh, the transcoder is super great at, and of course, it's very expensive because you have to convert from H.264 over to to WMV. Yeah, and I found that I'll be halfway through a 360 movie, and then it'll just drop, and it'll give me some obscure error, and I'm not really sure what happened. So that that has been a problem. Do do you think? And I apologize for putting you on the spot here, but you know that everyone on the planet wants an Xbox and or Xbox One app. Like that's the great. Uh, that would be that would make our lives just complete. It would be over at that point. We could all die because we'd have plex <laughs> everywhere. I, I've yeah, I've, I've definitely seen people on Twitter requesting it. Um, I think I think it would be great if plex were on those <laughs> devices. All right, I will. I guess that uh, the, the, the wink, wink, nudge, nudge. There's not much you can say about that, but I can say that when you go to plex TV, there's a row of logos at the bottom: Windows, Apple, Android, Google TV, Chromecast. It sounds like you definitely are trying to put it everywhere that you are allowed or able to do. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we look at where it makes sense to be, but um, generally, we just we just don't want, we want it to be universally available. So if you get a um, if you get a TV, you have a way to get Plex on there really easily. If you have a mobile device, you can run a Plex app on it. Yeah. Um, 
Definitely. The um, I noticed you just added Chromecast, and I am a huge fan of the Chromecast. I think of it as almost like wireless HDMI, although it's Google branded wireless HDMI. Yeah, I agree. I, I mean, the, the the demand for it at, right after it came out, we were seeing so much demand for it um, for Plex being on there, and we were super thrilled to to work with Google on it and be one of the you know one of the first apps on it, uh, and the, the first one of the first personal media apps. Um, and it's, it's great. People, people have a great experience with it at the cost. People are getting like four of them, you know, putting one on each TV, just throwing them out there. Um, and I, and I will say that if, if you're enjoying Plex on your Chromecast, uh, it's going to get better. Really? We're, we're doing, we're doing, yeah, we're, we're going to be, uh, enhancing the support for it. Um, and just making the video playback more reliable. And, um, also, as you'd expect, we're going to be adding support for uh, music and photos because right now we only support video. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that, that device is going to get, uh, to be a really nice <laughs> Plex client. Really? Yeah. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Like if you have, uh, there's your main living room, but if you have other rooms in the house where everyone's got like the, the guest room and there's really not a good set top box up there and there's really no solution, it's maybe got the cable plugged directly into it and you've forgotten about it. Right. And you plug a Chromecast into that thing and suddenly that becomes a really interesting, uh, thing. Like I have a guest come over and they've got an iPad and I say, Hey, there's a Chromecast in here and suddenly they're playing their media on the, on the Chromecast. Now help me understand the, the handshake with the relationship between the Plex server, the Chromecast, and then the device that initiated this, this relationship. Sure. It's, it's actually pretty cool. Um, and it, it sort of speaks to one of the uh, limitations of the Chromecast because essentially what the Chromecast is, it's a tiny little Linux computer and they run the Chrome browser on it. So essentially it's like Chrome.exe running on Linux. Um, and displaying a web page. And so when you, uh, try to fling media to it with your device, uh, to the Chromecast, what it does is it says, okay, you're the Plex app and it loads our receiver app. It's called the receiver app, but essentially it's just an HTML web page, just HTML and JavaScript off the internet down to the Chromecast. So you need internet connection for it to work. Mm-hmm. Um, so then once it loads, the receiver uh, is basically, again, just a page. We display the Plex waiting for cast, you know, waiting for you to play your media. And then um, the sender app, which is the mobile app in your hand, sends a message over to it and it talks directly to the server. So you can at that point, you know, throw your phone in the garbage and the media will keep streaming directly from the server to the Chromecast. So you've, you've negotiated a, a handshake You've said, hey, Chromecast, it's over there, and here's the token and everything that you need to go and make it, it happen. Exactly. Yeah, we pass the URL over. Here's a URL. Here's a server. Go get the media over there. And then the Chromecast, um, which actually shares a lot of code with our web app, as you might imagine, mm-hmm. goes and negotiates with the server and sets up a stream. And does the uh, do you have to do anything other than you, you've already had all the pieces there, I guess you did, didn't you? It, well, at the time, um, we needed to add, uh, support for Dash, the Dash format. A uh, Dash is yet another. There's, so there's HLS, HTTP live streaming. There's Silverlight smooth streaming. Um, and then Dash is kind of a new one, um, that there's some companies behind. Mm-hmm. And at the time when Chromecast first came out, that was the only sort of high level segmented format they supported. Mm-hmm. Um, so we had to, we had to add support for that. Um, but other than that, you know, most of the pieces were already there. We already had the web code. We already had the server. We already had, and the, the adding the, the SDK into the clients was super easy. Right, right. Dash is, is dynamic adaptive streaming over HTTP. It's also called MPEG Dash. And that's basically, uh, an alternative to HLS, HTTP live streaming. So it's, it's like Apple's, except it's not Apple. Yeah, it, it, but, it, and unlike HLS, it's also, I think, very much consortium driven. So if you look at the spec, um, it's kind of a combinatorial explosion of the things you can do with it. Mm-hmm. So I'm not, I, I like HLS because it's super simple. I understand, um, th- there are some nice advantages to Silverlight smooth streaming where they put the audio and video in different, um, fragment streams. So you can, you know, switch qualities on one and not the other. Mm-hmm. But I don't necessarily see the, the value out of Dash over, say, like Silverlight Smooth Streaming or in a practical real end user, HLS works great. Yeah, yeah. Just everything MPEG related involves multiple codecs, multiple choices, multiple containers, and lots and lots of choice. But HLS is pretty much, hey, it's Apple. It just works. Do this. And we promise everything will be fine. And it does work exactly as they advertised. Exactly. So we were super happy when Android added that in the, in the 3.0 timeframe. They added support for HLS. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the, this is again asking for a feature, but I've got Windows 8. I've got the, the surface. Is there any talk about maybe doing some of the offline syncing support on the Windows client? 
let's just say that, um, you know, we like the, the universal picture. We like to say you can do this anywhere you want. And so for us to have two mobile apps, Android and iOS, where you can sync to and Windows where you can't, uh, looks a little bit strange. Yeah. So we don't like things that look strange. <laughs> so, um, I paid for a Plex pass. You can get Plex, play with Plex, use it, sign up and do pretty much lots of stuff without paying you guys. Uh, what do I get Correct. when I pay? And thank you for your support. We really appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. No, I mean, um, it, it, honestly, this is a true story. Uh, uh, and again, I have, I have no relationship with Plex other than I'm a huge fan. Um, I gave you money without knowing what I was going to get just because <laughs> I said to myself, holy crap, I'm getting value here. It was literally a matter of I'm getting so much value and I'm, I'm effectively stealing because I felt like I was, you know, I felt like I was stealing. I was like, wow, this is really, I'm getting way more value than this. And I was like, oh, wow, 30 bucks a year. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I, you know, I, I would have just paid, if it was an open source project, I would have just PayPal the developer 50 bucks because like, wow, you've changed my life. You know what I mean? Just being able to get on an airplane and watch my movies without having to do a whole iTunes sync dance for hours was $30 of value. So yeah, I happily gave you my money, but I don't really know what I got. <laughs> no, <laughs> Tell me what I really, paid for. We really appreciate it. Um, so the, the essence of a Plex Pass is it, it gives you, um, a few different things. It gives you, first of all, it gives you premium features of which Plex Sync, um, is one of. Okay. Um, and there is also Cloud Sync where you can, instead of syncing to your device, you can actually sync up to say Dropbox or, or, uh, Bitcasa. Um, it also gives you access to uh, multi user control, which I spoke about earlier. Mm -hmm. So if you have, um, if you're sharing your media with anyone or you have multiple people inside the house, you have a profile for your kids, profile for your wife, that kind of thing. Um, you get multi user access. You also get, um, early access to new features. So for example, uh, the Chromecast, uh, feature right now is in a, in a Plex Pass preview. So the people who are Plex Pass, uh, holders got access to it and they will for a period of time and then it'll become free for everyone. Um, so you get early access to new features. You have, you know, the set of uh, premium features that I talked about. Um, you also have access to private forums on our, um, on our site so that you can get a little bit extra support and, um, stuff like that. You, we also make a lot of preview releases for things. So mm -hmm. if we're doing new stuff in the server and we, you know, we want a group of, in, of people to check it out, this brand new feature that came out, uh, you know, we throw that into Plex Pass. So it's, it's basically, it's like if you, if you love Plex, it's a great way to get kind of the best possible experience with Plex. You get access to all the new stuff earlier than everyone else. You get access to some features, um, some really cool features before everyone else gets access to them. And you get, you know, obviously permanent access to features like Plex Sync and Cloud Sync and multi-user and stuff like that. And there'll definitely be more features over time that'll um, that we'll be adding to the the server, just like the client runs everywhere. The server runs everywhere too, basically. Like when I go to downloads, there's a million choices about how I can run this. What is it written in? Great question. Uh, the server is written in C++ primarily. Um, it's, uh, uses the, probably the biggest, uh, if you want to get into details, the biggest third party library it uses is Boost. Hmm. Um, Boost is a, is a great, uh, C++ library, uh, full of extensive functionality and it just makes coding a lot easier. But in, in essence, Plex at its core is a highly multi-threaded HTTP server. Hmm. Um, now what's significant about Boost, uh, for people who aren't familiar with it is that, that it is, uh, advertised as a portable series of libraries. Correct. This is not just some, hey, there's some C++ and we use that. It's, it's, it's about being portable because it needs to work basically everywhere. Exactly. Yeah. And so, I mean, I, it's hard to even count the number of architectures that we've had the server running on. Um, we, you know, obviously Intel, obviously ARM. Um, we've had it running on MIPS. We've had it running, um, gosh, a lot of, a lot of different places. Um, and, and sort of scale from scale down really highly embedded stuff up to more, more powerful um, stuff, but we, we, we generally, we love working with the NAS guys. We've got a good relationship with, mm -hmm. um, you know, all the top NAS providers. And cause if you think about it, it's a really perfect match for a NAS device, right? You have this NAS device with a bunch of drives. You just threw a ton of media onto it. Now what, how do you get that media out everywhere? Like you're saying, and you know, Plex is the, is the, can help you with that. Right. On my Synology, it was actually in the Synology kind of quote unquote app store. So I, I was worried I'd have to go and shush into the thing and do a whole bunch of command line, but it really just, Oh, there's Plex right there. The Plex that I already was running on my windows machine. So for me, I literally went from running it on windows and it's living in the tray to buying a NAS, noticing it was available saying install, and then, I don't know, 15 minutes later with some configuration with a web interface, it was done. And it was just, and everything moved over there. 
Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and, we, and we'd like to get to that point where you un- unpackage your NAS box, plug it in, turn it on, and Plex is somewhere there waiting for you to, to click on it. Right, yeah, out of the box. And for people who already either have a NAS or maybe you have, I mean, everyone who's listening probably has a Windows machine they're not using or a Linux machine. It runs on Fedora, or Ubuntu, CentOS, FreeBSD. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, Mac and Windows. So that's, that's pretty fabulous. Yeah. We try to, we try to be everywhere. <laughs> well, yeah, you definitely succeed. Um, and then of course, you know, Drobo and Synology and QNAP and all that kind of stuff as well. Well, cool. Well, thank you so much for letting me be a fanboy and talk to you today. Uh, I want to continue to support Plex. I, I think you guys are great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me on and great talking with you. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes and we'll see you again next week. 